This video was made especially for the Cocosian channel. Hello friends! As you may have already guessed from the title of this video, today I'll show you how to build a digital PWM controller entirely using discrete logic. We'll figure out how it works, solder the circuit, and get it running. All useful materials will be linked in the video description. So, why do we need all this? In one of the previous videos, we looked at several interesting ways to generate a PWM signal using Soviet and other microchips. Of course, that video didn't cover circuits based on the 555 timer or microcontrollers, which nowadays only the lazy haven't built. You liked the video, and many of you are interested in the PWM generator circuit with button control built entirely on discrete logic. That's why this video was made. I should mention that the version of the digital PWM generator circuit presented in this video doesn't claim to be perfect, or the only correct solution. I would be glad to hear your ideas and suggestions in the comments. The printed circuit boards themselves were ordered from the JLCPCB website. There are no complaints about the quality. JLCPCB is a leading manufacturer of printed circuit boards for projects of any complexity and purpose. They can produce high quality boards, even up to 32 layers. You can choose from a wide range of solder mask colors, surface finishes, board thicknesses, and more. Prices start at just $2 for a batch of 5 10 by 10 cm boards, and right now there's a 30% discount coupon for 6 layer boards. JLCPCB offers a full production cycle. Thanks to strict quality control, the boards come out perfectly, every time. Standard production takes just a few days, and for urgent projects, there's even a 24 hour express option. Placing an order is simple. Just upload your project archive with the Gerber files, select your preferences, pay, and you're done. The company also provides PCB assembly, solder stencil creation, and commercial 3D printing services. JLCPCB, easy to use, affordable to produce, and reliable in operation. Check the link in the description. Let's think about the circuit. For simplicity, I decided to implement the principle of PWM generation that's used in microcontrollers. There's a certain counter that counts from zero up to its maximum value. At the moment it resets to zero, a reset signal is generated. Also, on every clock cycle, the value in the counter is compared with the value in a certain register, and when they are equal, a signal is generated as well, but this time it's a set signal. As a result, we get a PWM signal. I hope the general principle is clear. Let's move on to the microchips. First, we'll assemble everything in a simulator. The first thing we need is a clock pulse generator. In the simulator, for stability, we'll replace it with a ready-made generator. Now we need to feed the signal from the generator to the counter. Let's say the counter will be a decimal K155 IE2. Alright, the data at the counter's output is running now. Now we need to make a register that will store the reference value. How do we make it? Well, the simplest option is to add another counter like that, with its clock input connected to a button. Now we can load values into the counter. Each press will increase the value by 1, and when it reaches the maximum, it will automatically reset. Great, now we can compare these two values. That is, when the four bits of one counter are equal to the four bits of the other, a set signal needs to be generated. How do we do that? For this, we can use an exclusive or chip. Here is the truth table for such an element. When the values at the inputs are equal, the output is logic zero. When the inputs differ, the output is logic one. Alright, so we take a K155 LP5 chip and connect all four elements in pairs. The first output from the first counter to the first output of the second counter, and so on. After that, we connect all the outputs of the exclusive or gates through diodes and pull them down to ground. This is what's called a diode or circuit. Don't forget about the pull-up resistors, since the outputs of the LP5 chips are open collector. So, at this point, there will be a logic zero when the values in both counters are equal. You can also use a K155 SP1 or 7485 chip, which is actually a digital comparator for two 4-bit words. But in my circuit, I decided to use the most readily available components, and finding such a comparator isn't such an easy task. Alright, now we need to process the counter overflow signal. Some counters have an overflow output, which goes high when the counter resets but our counter doesn't have such an output. The simplest way, in my opinion, is to use the same kind of diode circuit. As a result, at the moment when all the diodes in the chip have a logic zero, there will be a logic zero at this point, and in all other cases, there will be a logic one. Now we need a component with a stable state that can be set and reset. 
And we have such a component, a flip-flop. Let's use the K155TM2 chip. This is a dual D flip-flop. We pull up the D and see inputs to the power supply, and we'll use the S in our inputs. To set the flip-flop, you need to apply 0 to the S input and 1 to the R input. To reset it, you need to apply 0 to the R input and 1 to the S input. To hold the stake, both inputs should be set to 1. If we apply two zeros, the state of the flip-flop will be undefined, and this is something you need to keep in mind. Now we have two signals. The signal from this point should reset the flip-flop, and the signal from this point should set it. Let's connect everything according to the following circuit. We place two NAND dates. The first receives the first signal inverted and the second signal. The second NAND date receives the second signal inverted and the first signal. As a result, when both signals are 0 or both are 1, the outputs of the NAND gates will be logic ones. The flip-flop will be in the hold state. When the first signal is 0 and the second is 1, the output of the upper NAND gate will be logic 0, since both its inputs are 1s. This 0 will go to the S input of the flip-flop and set it. The second NAND gate will receive two zeros, and its output will still remain at 1. Now, let's say the first signal is 1 and the second is 0. The situation will be reversed, and we'll get a reset signal, that is, a logic 0 at the output of the lower NAND gate. Let's connect an oscilloscope to the output of the flip-flop, and see what kind of signal we get there. What we see is nothing other than a PWM signal, which has about 10 states ranging from 0 to 90% duty cycle if we take the signal from the direct output of the flip-flop, and from 10 to about 100% duty cycle if we take the signal from the inverted output. Alright, that's good. Now let's move on to the actual circuit. First of all, we need to take care of button bounce. So, we use AK555 TL2 Schmidt trigger and a simple debounce circuit. Now, let's assemble the reference frequency generator. This will require two more Schmidt trigger elements. We'll use another one to make the initial reset circuit for the second counter. The remaining two Schmidt triggers will be used as inverters. We'll also add a low resistance MOSFET to the circuit, for example, from the IRL series, which are designed for logic level control. This means that when you apply 5 volts to it, it will fully turn on and hardly heat up at all. Let's scatter some filter capacitors around and add a step-down voltage regulator for 5 volts. I decided to just use a regular linear regulator to add a bit of that warm, vintage feel. But in reality, you can use any step-down DC-DC switching converter here. That will reduce heat generation. And really, in principle, we could stop here. But that's not as interesting. How do you know which mode is currently active? We have two options. Either use a 10 output decoder, connect it to the second counter, and add 10 LEDs, or do something more interesting. Use a KR514ID2 decoder and hook it up to a 7 segment display. That's exactly what I decided to do. And let's add a few transistors to increase the current the decoder can supply to the segments. We lay out the board and place an order with JLC PCB. I should mention that I've been thinking about this project for quite a while, and the first version of the board that I assembled and tested turned out, to put it mildly, to be pretty raw and overly complicated. Even though I fixed a lot of issues in it, the final version of the circuit that we've just gone over together seems to me more interesting, simpler, and clearer. But for those who are curious, here's the schematic I laid out on the first board. This or gate chip turned out to be a real gem, because it has an inverted output. And I had to wait a whole month for it. But as you can see, everything works perfectly. For example, I connected a piece of LED strip to the output. In the actual circuit, you need to add a small delay to the reset line so that in the zero mode, the flip-flop is set for a very short time and then immediately reset. You can do this by connecting the remaining and gates in series, using them as two consecutive inverters. A slight delay, and that will be enough. Well, as I said, we get 10 brightness modes. I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to share your thoughts and ideas in the comments below the video. And the best way to support the creator is to like and subscribe to the channel. Tell your friends about the video, and don't be afraid to learn something new. Wishing everyone good health. Take care of yourselves and your loved ones. This was Andre with you. Bye.